have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <coughs> Come on in. <laughs> My name is Jen Sung, and I'm the communications and community liaison staff here at the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the unceded, traditional, ancestral, and occupied land of the Musqueam First Nation. Today's event, featuring the miracle, will be our final event of the term as part of our Noted Scholars Lecture Series. It has truly been an incredible year, from making love and relations beyond settler sexualities, to representation in gaming and technology, to the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora, and to the pedagogies of radical <laughs> equality in prison humanities we have truly brought some outstanding ideas and outstanding people to the Social Justice Institute and our extended communities. We thank you for simply showing up. To stay up to date on our events, follow us on our Facebook page, Social Justice Institute BC events, as well as our Twitter at GRSJ Institute. You can go ahead and use the hashtag GRSJ or hashtag GRSJ uh, events. Today we are so thrilled to partner with our social justice research network, Indigenous Pedagogies, to bring Lee Miracle to UBC, visiting all the way from Toronto, here to introduce Jules Kostachin. Oh, no! <laughs> here, here to introduce Lee Miracle is Jules Kostachin who's a PhD student from the Institute <laughs> for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. Jules, Jules mentioned that she was a bit shy, so uh, if you could all give a huge encouraging welcome to Jules, that would be great. Date my uh, bios on the web. I'm sorry. I'm not an instructor for 
Banff anymore. They decided to do hip hop. <laughs> I couldn't even listen to it when, when it was popular, you know, so. <laughs> but I have to tell you, the hip hop boys invited me to the first hip hop conference in Montreal. And I said, why am I invited to this? <laughs> I did want to say, I don't even like you guys. But anyhow. <laughs> My son had to translate the uh, piece that uh, he liked by Public Enemy, Chuck D, <laughs> because there was a tape out there with me and Chuck D on it. And he, he says, you have to know at least one of his tunes, you know? <laughs> anyway, it turned out that I did a bunch of tapes with a group of Native people in the 80s, and we had a band and all that. It was spoken word, but not hip hop and it inspired kids to get into hip hop, which apparently is easier to do than what we were doing, which was what my grandfather did. The first spoken word and music piece in the world was done by my grandfather. In 1967, there's a copy of it on the web that my uncle uh, orates, and it's called Lament for Confederation. There was no title for it in the beginning. My grandpa asked if he could talk. They said they could, he, no, you can only sing. We don't want to hear any Indians talking at Canada's birthday. So in front of 35,000 people and national television, he disobeyed <laughs> and inspired a whole generation of red power advocates, including me. I'm a Tema, a brat. Everybody says their Indian name, eh? That's mine. <laughs> but also Pakham, which is sweetheart. I get called sweetheart a lot. And that's because I was a brat. <laughs> they hope as you grow up that it changes you somehow. My aunt says to me when my daughter, who's the same age as Jules, they're kind of like my twins, uh, she was misbehaving and I, I said, I don't know what to do about it. She says, call her sweetheart, work for you. <laughs> oh, I thought it was because I was nice. <laughs> Apparently not. I'm gonna read you a little bit of uh, Celia's song. This is a long journey. All of my stories are based on original stories. I was talking to a young Nishnabe woman and she says, we didn't need white people to come here and teach us how to be assholes. You know, we, were, we, we did this once before and I said, yeah, we have a story about it. It's called The Double-Headed Sea Serpent. And the first uh, dysfunction in families and the breakdown of families and the, and the burgeoning of family violence comes from natural disaster and the inability of human beings particularly men, to deal with unspeakable grief or mass death. And that has been plaguing humans since the beginning of humanity. We've had very many uh, what they call mass death uh, events. And one of them in the world is the flood. And every nation, every people has a flood story. And the scientists that we brought over here, because we needed to, to explain this to us. <laughs> Sorry, I have to throw that in. <laughs> anyway, they say uh, a meter passed by and hauled the waters this way and that all over the world, and, and that's what caused the flood. We don't care what caused it. Uh, you know, the Bible says it was like people were misbehaving and that sort of thing. So Noah had to build an ark, um, but. In our communities, when there's a flood, the men say, run up the hill, <laughs> and they hop in the boats. And we have stories that we got flung far and wide. And if you look at the whole Pacific Rim, these magnificent totem poles find fit their faces in Micronesia, Melanesia, Ainu territory, it's on the bottom of their skirts. Maori territory, Polynesia, Cook Islands, all the way down to uh, Baja, California, um, and in Mexico. You can find our art 
forms, those beautiful art forms that uh, come from the West Coast here. And they take slightly different shape in each uh, people's area, but the fundamental shapes are the same all the way around the Pacific. And there's something about Pacific Islanders and the Pacific Coast people. Uh, we did a book together some 10 years ago, it won the American Book Awards. Sherman Alexie was the uh, sort of inspiration for it all, all us Pacific Rim people, and found out that fish was the hub of all our memories. Salmon is the hub of all our memories. And that salmon comes from the flood. Because the men left, and the women were starving. And so Raven came and gave us sockeye. And he told the men, when they were being violent to the women, that the sockeye will disappear if they don't treat the women right. So in 1995, when all these salmon were committing suicide, the boys were saying, it's because the white guys are poisoning the rivers. And I wrote them all and said, no. It's got to do with violence against women. It was actually 2000. So then that year, all those boys jumped uh, into the uh, candlelight vigil in 2001. They joined the candlelight vigil for Aboriginal women. And the next year, the biggest salmon run since 1905 occurred. <coughs> These stories are true. And this one is about the double-headed serpent. And I love this story. I was one of the last stories I had a chance to talk to my father about it. We had like two uh, serious conversations in my entire 64 years of life. <laughs> he was 91 when he, when he died. Uh, one was on this double-headed serpent, and the other was on Raven. Apparently, his name is Transformer, which is Raven. And so he knows a lot about Raven. But he also knows, knew about the double-headed serpent. And so this conversation uh, was saying, he was saying the split mind that occurs after a disaster or some unspeakable grief occurs and people don't know how to grieve, they don't know how to do shui shui, then this uh, implosion occurs and uh, people start to become violent toward each other. And we call it the split mind, but the white people actually have a name for it too. And I said, yeah, but it's a recent name. And he says, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's called bipolar disorder. <laughs> but we've had it for 8,000 years. We know about this disease, and we know how to deal with it. And so this is the book about these women dealing with it. And someone caught me yesterday, Anishinaabe woman says, oh, this is how, about how to deal with bipolar disorder and PTSD, right? <laughs> yeah, those Anishinaabe's know how to study, I tell you. <laughs> they figure things out. <laughs> I wrote it first, <laughs> 2000, and then I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it 29 times. I was telling Jules about that. And then I handed it to a publisher. He said it was too ethnic. <laughs> <laughs> so then Cormorant, I finally went to Cormorant, who was publicly begging me for a manuscript. And he said, make it more ethnic. Because <laughs> it's sort of teetering on the edge, you know, <laughs> just over the edge. So we did. And although it's made top 20 of everything in Canada, it has won an award, and that's I think got to do with sexism and racism in Canada, period. It's way better than Arenda. <laughs> and I love Joseph. <laughs> but it is. This is a magnificent book. And it's part of Raven's song, which, by the way, is spelled improperly. Apparently, my, <laughs> my publisher did that. Raven's song is one word. It's actually a song Raven sings, the song of change. There's something helpless in being a witness. No one comes here anymore, just me. I can't seem to exist, re resist returning to the place where everyone died. Some insane kind of illness overtook them, burnt them with its heat. The monster illness disfigured them before taking their lives. It's so quiet. This is Mink talking. He's actually our trickster, not Raven. If you're talking to me, don't call Raven a trickster. Raven's bigger than that. 
She transformed the world and the universe. The longhouse is de decrepit now. I stand transfixed. It looks as though a single shingle had blown off the roof during a storm, beginning the process of destruction, precipitating the damage inside. And that's exactly how the hurt begins. One shingle at a time. One person at a time. And over time, everybody implodes. See? The metaphor is right there. Right in the very beginning. If you understand something about our story, you know what's going to happen in this book. The fire in the center died long ago, but the wet ashes made the inside seem forlorn. A lonely feast bowl squats near where the fire had been. The damp has spread to all corners now, and over the decades, storm rains invaded and reinvaded the longhouse, tearing more and more shingles in a steady rake. The wet penetrated. Summer heat spurred the blankets decay. The bones lie naked underneath the rotted weavings. Under these, the dead rot. Even after all this time, the smell of them commingles with the molding blankets and mats. The scent is horrific. Mold, flesh, and goat fiber rot fill the house. The bones of the dead loathe their own stench. They should not be here. I worry for the dead. Piled up in the longhouse of this village, behind the perishing cedars just before the hill, the bones fret inside the decrepit structure. The people were here one day, then gone. Some small part of me resists their departure. They didn't volunteer to leave, but I resent their departure nonetheless. Some days I resent their absence. It creates such a desolate landscape, but today is not such a day. Still, I empathize with the petulance that summer simmers inside the angry bones. The intensity of their rage grows with time. The bones wait, wait for burial, wait for ceremony, wait for their final resting place. They shift and rattle their discontent. I breathe deep. There's not much I can do but visit and witness for them. That was before the storm broke. Before the storm, the serpent protecting the house hung by a thread. No one had fed or acknowledged him. I doubt that many living humans know about this village. It's not the only one, but not that that matters. What matters is that the serpent had a right to be upset. The singing had stopped for the house protector before the inhabitants had died. It stopped during the pro prohibition laws. No singing, the newcomers had said. This seems comic to me. And I want to laugh. I mean, how bad can singing be? But it had been devastating for the people and to the serpent, so I restrained myself. The humans broke their contract with the serpent when they stopped feeding and singing for him. This breach granted permission to the serpent to slide from the house and return to the sea. But both heads didn't want to go. Just one did, the restless head, the one that preferred Shadowland. Shadowland is the land of the dead. Uh, that are not quite gone to the right place. Purgatory, you probably think of it. Um, but bad things happen there. <laughs> That's not funny, eh? <laughs> She's so nasty. <laughs> Current living humans did not seem worried about the uh, breach with the serpent. I wonder if perhaps they no longer believe they had protection they need protection from him. In any agreement, both parties must hold up their own end in a timely manner for the de deal to be secure. I guess in these days of cars and electric fire, 
it may not appear all that rational to restore old practices. The bones th think me a tad too generous. They lack generosity. Creeping along the longhouse wall are bracken, wild carrots, ill-scented weeds, some edible, some not. The plants lack lush leaves, bent and withering, they died, looking crippled before they had a ch chance to mature, as though the loneliness for humans had affected their ability to grow straight and strong. But still they had reached for the sun. I peek inside the house, the fleshless bones whimper songs of yearning, yearning for the sea as though they continued to miss it. They missed much more. They missed babies gurgling from cradle boards. They missed toddlers just before they spoke words. They missed the music of song and they missed dance. They missed the sound of eagerness only youth make as they roll out the dugouts and challenge the sea for the first time. They missed the vision of the musculature of their young sons as they paddle to visit another village. I miss that too. But for the crippled cedars, twisted arbutus, faltering alders, fir and spruce, and the odd berry bush, nothing much lives here anymore. The old camas fields and riparian vegetation are dead. No more sea asparagus, sea cabbage, not a single sea vegetable. Coyote, bear, wolf, and deer fled after the people died. They never returned. I keep coming back to reminisce. Like the sea, the people who once lived here were by turns vivacious and steady, peaceful and vicious, consistent and variable, hardworking and lazy. I love them. <laughs> I can't seem to live without them. We used to have a gauntlet that the Haidas had to run, eh? <laughs> And the gauntlet was terrible. It was like shooting at them right there while they were paddling to catch a whale down south. But anyhow, <laughs> that was the viciousness. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Sometimes I guess we miss things we shouldn't miss. Before I get a chance to remember them fully as individuals, rain clouds from the west gather and form a thunderhead. It rolls toward the village. I need to seek cover. The wind storms so much that the cedars edging the lagoon in front of the village have been crippled by it, bent in half as though for heading for shore. The inland trees lean away from the wind. I shiver as I imagine the sun quivering before the clouds thicken and obscure its light as they gray the sky. The noise increases. West wind screams now, sounds agonized. The storm hits. I take cover behind an old log to watch. And that metaphorically is what the implosion of our communities looks like. We are bent and crippled and trying to straighten up in a terrible storm. The storm is not over yet, but it shows signs of abating. And this little mink is witnessing it. I'm just gonna read another little bit because Celia is a character in this book that was in Raven's Song. In Raven's Song, she's only seven years old, so she doesn't get to witness the epidemic. She gets sent to her grandma's, and then, bless her mother's heart, her grandma wants to keep her, so her mother lets her have her youngest daughter. Then the grandma dies, and this story begins just after, a year after Celia's son hung himself and nobody knows why. But they asked the question, why this young boy? And so they told the story of Raven's Song. And then this story begins right after that story ends. And it's mainly about Celia. Okay, so Celia sees something. Celia's attention to, is drawn to the sunken longhouse downhill from Mink close to the lagoon. She's a seer. She thinks she hears the bones in the longhouse talking. They seem to want this storm, behave as though they need it. She hears them say, someone has to pay for decades of neglect. Someone has to appease our need for respect. She shudders. 
Up until now, her delusions had centered on humans in full form. Even the dead she saw had bodies. This is the first time she'd heard Bones talk. I know the Bones are waiting for internment, but there will be no burial for them. The living humans do not know they're here. The Bones want more than internment. They want to hear war songs that capture this drama, commit it to memory and identify the enemies for them. But the humans who could clarify these things are dead. Inside me an abyss of fear forms. I can't contain this emptiness, nor can I prevent the fear from sinking roots inside my body. I have been witness to so much of the old bones mythology. The dead deserve a witness to the story unfolding. But still, I do not want to stay. I have to leave. I so wanted to leave, but this story cannot unfold without a witness. This story needs a witness. Why me? I rub my paws one over the other. The dead cherished myths while alive, and the people gave the stories weight at one time. But now so much has changed that I'm not sure of anything. I shift from one foot to the other and then focus on the storm. In a perverse and fearful way, I like the looking. But I'm not so crazy about this business of shaking with the fear that the unfolding story inspires in me. I have some doubt about the intelligence and safety of staying behind to witness. But some part of me, some piece of me, believes that doubt is, is somehow the best part of being alive. I love the suspiciousness of doubt and all the angles for retelling stories that this doubt spawns. This story deserves to be told. Well, all stories do. Even the waves of the sea tell a story that deserves to be read. The stories that really need to be told are those that shake the very soul of you. I prepare to be shaken. And this happened even if it didn't. <laughs> That's what we call fiction. We have a little game we play when I was a little kid. We play, I played it with my kids. And Apparently, Jules played it with her students, too, which is really great, <laughs> because it's a, it's a great game. And it's telling it back different but the same. They the old people tell you a story, then they tell you to tell it back different but the same. So it's got to mean the same, have the same characters, and all that kind of stuff. You, you never do get it right, because you're a kid, right? But nonetheless, you do your best. You know? <laughs> and you're telling this story to your grandpa or whatever. And they make you feel like they really need to hear it. And it makes you so confident to have that belief. I think that's what our elders give us, is belief. They just believe us. I remember paddling to Lamy. One year I was five. My grandpa says, help me paddle to Lamy. I said, OK. I jump in the canoe all proud of myself to help, to help my grandma. My grandpa paddle. Now my grandpa's a pa uh, champion paddler. <laughs> He's the winner of all the doubles, along with my dad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and the win winner of uh, all the eleven-man canoe races all over this west coast, Washington, Victoria, Vancouver Island here. But no, I think I've got to help him. <laughs> I'm five. You know, <laughs> so we get there. And he says hello to everybody as we land. It's not very far by water to Bellingham, by the way. It's 35 miles by land, but about six or seven by sea. But you're going over the deepest sound in the world. The, double, uh, the, the octopus lives at the bottom, and you're not just awesome. Anyway, paddling, you can't, it's black. It's so dark, it's so deep. And uh, we get there, and I tell everybody, I had to help my grandpa get here. <laughs> and they all get proud of me. <laughs> the delusion is set. <laughs> 
Actually, I have a mic here. Oh, oh that's for the camera. Oh, OK. <laughs> I thought you were trying to <laughs> make me talk louder. <laughs> I want to read you a little bit of this book of poems. This has come out just after Celia's song, and it's not on the agenda, but I'm going to read you a little bit. Anyway, some of these poems are old, and some of them are new. Um, <laughs> some of them are a bit ridiculous. Paradigm, that's the one that I always had trouble with in sociology, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. And uh, I always had a paradigms, you know? <laughs> so, a little play on words here. Paradigms, P-A-R-A -A and then D-I-M-E-S. Dangling confusion presses up against walls of my bent box. Paradigms scrape its carved fragility, threatening the box's bent shape. Disempowered intellectuals seek social parallels, ignore the paradigm, with the G, implied by my bent box. Well, this is Jagged Ed Stones. Uh, this guy should get an award for design, because he just did a beautiful job on my little book of poems. In the moment, it was difficult to appreciate stones covering my path. Oh. I have to tell you, I won this award in America. It was a bunch of money, first of all, so I could pay my mortgage for a couple months, uh, and a retreat for a month. And I remember saying to my daughter, Columpa, what if I don't want to be a writer? And I was crying. And she was chasing me all over the yard, because I was running all over the yard. <laughs> Very <laughs> Totally freaked out. What if I don't want to do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> what if I'm good at it? <laughs> too late, too late. You have four books out. <laughs> That's more than any other Indian right now. <laughs> anyway, I was telling her that uh, I look behind me and I see all the sharp rocks on my path. And I realized I danced my way across without getting too hurt sharp as they were, tough as the trail was, and that I made sure that my children didn't get too hurt either. But I also didn't coddle them. If there was an elephant in the room, they were the first to hear the story of it. Sivak <laughs> too, <laughs> he's next in line, catching elephants. <laughs> I got a bunch of elephant hunters. So these are the stones that I'm talking about. In the moment, it was difficult to appreciate st the stones covering my path, so I didn't. I worked at living. I laughed and sang at just about everything, gathering bits and pieces of knowing from whatever corner of the earth would give it to me. I tucked this knowing in old tattered shirts, <coughs> torn jeans, cheap shoes. I scraped my knees on more than one stone as I knelt to earth, to wind, to rain. Tattered and fatigued, I kept going and stopping to look at the trail. Afraid to see the sharpness, sorry, not stopping to look at the trail, afraid to see the sharpness and doubt the journey was worth it. I hopped, stepped, and jumped from stone to stone, stole smiles from the light, grabbed courage. I finally cast a backward glance. I can still see those old stones, sharp. In between them was all this color, shafts of purpling trail, gold, scarlet, yellow spikes lighting me up and me shuffling. In retrospect, I love to ride. <laughs> There's some long poems in here. I love long poems. Um, one is called Talking to the Diaspora. And I was asked to do uh, a mentorship with a person from a diaspora. And I was shocked to learn that uh, these people that ran the diaspora dialogues thought every from every, everyone from a diaspora was a person of color. I just started laughing. I said, well, you guys don't know much about the Irish then, eh? Or the Welsh or the English even. <laughs> everyone here is part of a di diaspora <laughs> if they're not indigenous. And even us are starting to become diasporic, like we're going from Vancouver to Toronto looking for work, getting cast amongst the Anishinaabes that we don't even understand. <laughs> Don't speak the same language. We're just as <laughs> ignorant as the rest of the world in Toronto. <laughs> Anyhow, I wrote a poem called Talking to the Diaspora. 
and it's for everyone. And I believe that we are one wheel of humanity, except for the one percenters. And they are by their choice and their behavior outside the wheel of humanity. By their choice and by their behavior outside our wheel of consideration. They're sp going to spend billions rape in the north. They're in progress right now. They don't belong on this wheel of humanity. Those of us who love the earth will prevail. Anyhow, I wrote a long poem today. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to read you this short one, and then we're going to get back to talking about Celia. The light of my arc reaches the precipice, trails itself to the end of the earth's breath. These ends hook themselves to each shore. On this bridge of light across turtles bat, free spirits dance. That's how you got here on a thing of light, right? <laughs> okay, it's uh, question time, actually. So you know everything, that's good. <laughs> then you can maybe teach me something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, Thanks. music man. Yeah, well, so I've been on, I've been a couple of times in here, writing in the poem you mentioned song. Yeah. Can you talk about songs a little bit? Yeah, you know, people ask me to be a keynote speaker, and lately I've taken to giving them a keynote. Uh -huh. Ohio once, and I had a hard time saying the word Ohio. I always wanted to say Ohio, because everything starts with Ohio. You know how our songs start, right? <laughs> and then I heard this story. 10,000 years ago, there was a war here, and the men killed women and children, and Raven came and told the women they have to kill themselves. And the women agreed they would tell them that. And so the men said they wanted them to build a big funeral pyre. So they laid down giant cedars. And the man asked that only that when they are all burnt, that they take their bones and carry them in their aprons and purify them. So they agreed to do that. So they laid themselves on the fire. They burnt themselves. And the women gathered their bones. And they were so grieved, they decided to leave. And with their old people and their children, they walked for four seasons and got to a place of the double-headed serpent, which happens to be Ohio. And they stayed there, and there was already people there, and they created a new world. And those women carried the same stories with them, and, created, and with those new men, they created the Iroquois people, the longhouse people of the East. And so I came to that place, and this fellow who's uh, Shalagi, they call him. <laughs> Cherokee. <laughs> he says, that's the true story of how we got here. And I said, I believe it. And he says, yeah, we call it Ohio, too. Only they go, Ohio, <laughs> really fast. <laughs> I love uh, longhouse music in the East, but it's very fast. And that my daughter came out to visit, and she says, they sing just like us, except faster. <laughs> and I said, yeah, they talk fast, too. They, they speak uh, English pretty quick. Um, we don't, you know, we're kind of slow about speaking English. So song be begins everything. You know, I learned in uh, sociology from Karl Marx, made me laugh my head off. He says, language came with the invention of tools. And I started to laugh, and I said, so there's this African women for a million years not saying a fucking word to their kids. <laughs> Let them stick their fingers in the fire, because we don't have no tools yet. <laughs> Come on, you lazy ass, and this the tools. <laughs> First thing that happens is we made up a song, didn't we? 
Uh, at least that. Shut the kid up. <laughs> you gotta sing to shut him up. <laughs> or her. <laughs> and so then songs came about, and that's what we say. Everything begins with song. So all our ceremonies address birth by beginning with song. And the, the everywhere is beautiful, this little, little part, and then there's actual words that go in each song um, that become part of our ceremonies. Even uh, new songs, you know, are made in the same way. We, we begin the same way. And our guys sing as low as they can, and the women sing it whatever way they like, because that's the way of women. But I also wrote a novel recently um, it's coming out next year. It, it's this little mink that wants to go to Earth, come back to Earth to see his father's landscape. And I know that every Canadian has this hurt. We don't have our father's landscape. We're from somewhere else. And if you're from here, the landscape changed. You know, uh, you heard about my, the loss of my sea vegetables, the, the prairies, the loss of the buffalo, and so on. And of course, Toronto is just one big mass of pavement. You know, it's a parking lot. <laughs> and even uh, Joni Mitchell grieves that. So I thought it would be a real universal book, you know. We're all hungry for this landscape. And plus, Gianna Pastrarca, who's a wonderful poet that I love, wrote the poem, Looking for My Father's Landscape. It made me cry, <laughs> you know, for, for Canada. <laughs> I don't often do cry for Canadians. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> Uh, he came and as he's passing through space, I had to research space, and our galaxy is held together by sound. That is so awesome, and it's a deep sound, just like the way we sing. The, the galaxy has a keynote, and it holds everything together. Hang on, boys, we're going for a ride. <laughs> Anyhow, beautiful, eh? So that's what I know about song, um, and, and that I'm not a singer. And when we say that, people say, well, everybody can sing. I said, well, that's not the point. Not everybody can remember a freaking song. <laughs> I'm not one that can. I can't remember our family song. <laughs> I have to have my family there singing it with me to remember the, the words. I only know the first two lines of every song I like. Yeah. So that's why I'm not a singer. But I do know the key note. <laughs> Anybody else? Can you talk about the words? Yeah. Uh, wow. I, I was 19 when I was sitting with uh, Richard Atlio, who's the founder of Malaspina College University and the Anishinaabe study, or not Anishinaabe, I mean, not in the East, <laughs> Coast Salish Studies <coughs> program that exists there. And we were talking about what we would do in the future for the nations that we belong to. And he committed to getting a PhD and uh, developing a, a real cultural um, program of study for West Coast people. And I committed to writing books, and he committed to teaching them, making sure they got taught. And he, of course, he, he, he honored those commitments. He reached his goals. So did I. Uh, la, la, la. And uh, <laughs> Celia was born then. I wanted to write about the epidemics at some point. And that was an accident uh, that it came out when it did. I kind of thought I was too young to be uh, dealing with that subject. But there was this three-day novel writing contest. <laughs> and I was telling my kids, don't let me think about anything. I've got to start at midnight. So they were singing and getting me to play word games and all this stuff till midnight. And then they let me, cut me loose. And a uh, song came out of it. I was so tired, I almost didn't finish it. But they go up and they dug up the wooden spoon and said, shouldn't we be writing? You know, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Because we thought I would win and get three beds. <laughs> I came second, got one bed. <laughs> Gave it to Columba because she's the one that made me finish. <laughs> she deserves the bed. <laughs> uh, but Celia, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to answer a lot of people's questions, tell the story of Celia, what happened to her. Because she disappears in Raven's Song. She's a very strong character 
on the first page and a half, she's the seer. And then she disappears. And I said, they said, why did you just <coughs> erase her like that? I, said, I wanted people to miss her. They we, we miss our kids. Yes, that's just good. So every person that's ever read Raven's song said, I really wanted to hear more about Celia. <laughs> So I waited until she was 44 years old, and then I, then I wrote Celia's song. Um, Raven's song, by the way, is more remembered than the person who won. And the person who won had a 40-page paragraphical outline, and I said to them, that's a rewrite. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a contest. And he says, what, you didn't think about it until you started? I said, that's right. I made sure these teenagers kept me from thinking until I started. He says, are you aboriginal? I said, yeah, you people are way too honest. <laughs> but anyway, I got my $110, bought a futon for Columbia. <laughs> First bed in the family. <laughs> and Celia took a long time after. But it's when I won that award, it was a retreat. The draft of it was born there. The draft was only 146 pages. And for some reason, I thought it was about 40. So I let it alone for about four or five years. And then I thought, oh, come on, do your, do your duty. It's the last book you committed to, to working on, which was the story of the double-headed serpent. So I went and had a conversation with my dad. And then I came back. And it was 146 pages. Oh my god, that's a simple rewrite. Because <laughs> it only has to be 196. I only need 40 more pages. <laughs> yeah, so, but it took a lot of rewrites. Every inch was fought for. Uh, I talked with my daughters a lot about um, the theory of the split mind and the story of the serpent and my aunts and my dad. And finally, uh, the story came out the way it was supposed to. Anybody else? We got the basics. Yes, yeah. What is your driving force behind sharing these stories at an emotional level? Yeah. There's a guy named Ibsen. I don't know if you know who he is. He wrote The Doll's House or something like that. Uh, it's a play. Uh, but the thing I remember reading from him is that um, poetry, but to me, say writing, <laughs> storytelling, is like a tarantula in a jar. You don't really want it to be there, but just as it's about to die, you will go and feed it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's some tarantula running around in there that's <laughs> making me do this. <laughs> I'd gotten up in the middle of the night with a story in my head and started going, and it turned out to be a frickin' novel. <laughs> I was there for two more days, <laughs> getting a draft. Once I started a draft, I can't stop. <coughs> and, you know, this, uh, this last novel took me uh, a month to get a draft. Uh, no, actually three weeks to get a draft. It was that story of the three minks. And it's not even a serious story. It's fun. You know, it's a fun little story. But I, when, once I get started, I can't stop. And once I was in a windstorm, and all my kids and my husband was gone, and that tree fell on the house, and you know, oh shit was hitting the fan. I was scared out of my mind. I don't know if I write a novel, I won't hear it. <laughs> Which is true. So I wrote Sun Dogs. <laughs> and I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> they came home, and I was still <laughs> and once I start, I can't stop. Now, poetry's different. I'm more deliberate about poetry. Uh, with a story, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Like, I couldn't think of anything for the, the, the writing residence that I, I paid $10,000 for that story. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh my god, what if I don't come up with anything? Because for a week, nothing happened. <laughs> I thought, well, I can always write some poems. So I started writing some poems called Music. Music Mon, Music to no titles. You know, I couldn't think of any titles. Um, and I had eight, and that's when the main story came. And I, I left the uh, 
music poems behind. I'm going back to them this summer. So poetry is more deliberate. I can do it any time. Um, but a story is like the tarantula. It, it has to get out, it has to be fed. And the only food is actually getting to the typewriter or the computer and fly at it. Um, I have a computer that has no letters on the keyboard. That's how much I write. And somebody said they want to get me a new keyboard because they can't stand looking at that keyboard. <laughs> but it's only six months old and it's already starting to get faded letters. <laughs> I can't stop. Uh, so other than that, I don't really know. But I think when I was small, my elders saw uh, my grandpa heard me tell a lie. And, and uh, he was looking at me, I remember how hurt he was. And then all these emotions go through him. And finally he smiles and says, that was a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and he started playing that game of tell it back different but the same every day with me and all, getting all the other elders to do it too. And I guess I had a facility for t telling bullshit tales. Eh? <laughs> and he finally tells me, you learn to write because White people will pay a lot of money for that crap. <laughs> but don't you ever lie to me again. <laughs> I thought he was going to kill me. <laughs> so between those two things, I think there is a driving force that, was, that, that, that my elders saw in me and cultivated. And that is what our responsibility is toward our children, is to see their gifts and cultivate them. Yeah. Um, that's all our only responsibility to our kids. You know, we think we're supposed to uh, bring them gifts and things. No, we don't have to. Um, we don't have to give them anything, you know. It's basic food and cultivate the gifts. Um, provide a roof if that's possible. But I was homeless quite a few times with my kids. They survived it. But they had gifts. All of them are gifted. And I fed those gifts. Same with my grandkids. You know, one of them wanted to learn to sing and play guitar, so I bought her guitar and guitar lessons. She never did do sing, you know. So what? If she wants to, and she's 50 years old, like, uh, what's her name? Joy Harjo. She wants to pick up that sax when she's 50, fine. <laughs> and she starts becoming a musician. She's more known as a musician now than a writer. You never know. Long answer, eh? <laughs> anybody else got a short question? We got five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, anybody, anybody. Okay, it's a, it's a written question. Do you write about world peace? No. Um, I write about uh, people who are working toward ro world peace. Like I wrote about Nelson Mandela, I wrote about Martin Luther King, um, but I don't write about world peace per se. Yeah? Uh, I write about justice uh, when I get the opportunity. And I, I uh, in ta uh, Diaspora Dialogues, in the Talking to the Diaspora, I, I wrote about the, the global peace for the globe, the, the actual earth. We don't think of global peace, we don't think of the earth. I think of the earth uh, and the peace that the earth deserves. Well, does that answer your question? Very disturbed about the bomb yesterday. I'm not sure what that is. I don't know about the bomb yesterday. Anybody tell me that? Brussels. They had a bomb again. It's the second one, right? Oh, two bombs in one day? I thought there was one some time ago. Paris. Okay. Um, well, of course, everybody's disturbed about bombs. Um, I have to say, though, that North America kills way more people than the bombers. <laughs> and we're not too disturbed about that. Yeah. We kill people by wearing t-shirts from Walmart. We kill children every day. 
We worked them to death for our little t-shirts. I want 30 t-shirts because I deserve 30 t-shirts. So I have to buy them cheap from Walmart. I can't buy fair trade. So the children die every day for us. It doesn't disturb our meals at all. Have another cup of tea. Worry about the guys in France. No. We should worry about everybody that dies. Heat from the climate change that we caused kills more people in the world every year than all the other natural disasters put together. Heat stroke. They drop like flies in the, in the uh, poorer countries. Don't hear us squawking about that. Don't you dare do tar, tar sands. That's what I say, because that's where it's coming from. Use a little less oil, have a little less plastic, and there'll be a little less death. Not to uh, have a rant here, sir, but <laughs> let's put things in context. 55 million people a year. How many died in Brussels? 31. Yeah. 34, 55 million. Well, they were white. I guess they're way more important than the other 55 million. <laughs> Think about it first before you yeah, ask a woman of color a question like that. <laughs> yeah? Okay. It's 1 o'clock, and I hear we're out of here. You're all Cinderella. You can come up to me outside and ask me your question. <laughs> Thank you.